am honored and it is a pleasure to introduce to this August body the speaker for the evening. I am sure that everyone has looked forward to hearing what this distinguished and dynamic personality shall bring to us. I shall give a brief synopsis of his contributions. A native of Greenville, South Carolina, he obtained the bulk of his academic experience in the South, receiving a BS in biology from North Carolina A&T University and a DDS from Meharry Medical College School of Dentistry. After completing a one-year internship in New York at Harlem Hospital in 1959, he returned to his hometown of Greenville where he established a successful private practice in drone dentistry. Since working with and assisting people has always been his specialty, it is not surprising to discover the major role he has played in forming educational, political, religious and legislative policies in the Southeast region. Some of his roles are President Greenwood Branch NAACP, President South Carolina Conference of Branches of NAACP, Chairman of the South Carolina Advisory Committee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights, Delegate for the Democratic National Convention in 1968-76 and 88. So at this time, I would like to introduce to some and present to others our speaker for the evening in the person of the Dr. William G. Gibson, DDS, and chairman of the National Board of Directors of the NAACP. Let's all give him a handshake. Let's put our hands together. A handshake. Shake his hand. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis, for that most energetic and most, uh, I guess you could say, exaggerated introduction of me. I'm trying to be modest, Bill. All right. <laughs> Seriously, thank you very much. It means a lot, not only because you did it so well, but because of kinds of work that you do. Uh -huh. When somebody <laughs> says something about you ain't doing nothing, it don't mean too much to me. Uh -huh. But when folks are out in the vineyard doing it themselves, that adds a, a great dimension to the words, and I thank you. To our mistress of ceremony, Ms. Darlene Jackson, moving this program along. Got that lineup out there straight. <laughs> I learned one thing about lineups. Don't say nothing. <laughs> just, just, just move where they tell you to go. Because I've seen fights start <laughs> at the lineup. <laughs> so I've learned well. To President William Cofield, young man who I met a few years ago, who has done great things in moving in the NAACP structure and in Korea for himself as well. State conference president, my fellow board member, my brother, as you can tell that we have a brotherhood there. Yeah. Sound like I had a few other brothers here too. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody bother me, I call my brother so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but Bill is not only my brother in my fraternity, but he's my brother in the fight for civil rights. Yeah. He's an ally. He's a man who is always able to be called on and he will respond. And as I know you see the kinds of leadership that he demonstrates here, he demonstrates that same kinds of leadership on the National Board of Directors. And I'm proud and happy to, to call him my friend. To the other officers of this great Kentucky State Conference, a conference that has a tremendous history, a tremendous history of achievement and accomplishments. And I had the pleasure tonight to, to meet two of the giants upon whom you stand in Kentucky tonight, 
one who was just mentioned, Dr. Lyman T. Johnson, yeah, yeah. and also Reverend J.W. Hodge, All one right. of the longtime leaders in this great struggle. I told him, as I always tell my friends and who are senior to me in this organization, that I understand well that it's a whole lot easier for me to lead today than it was in 1940. Amen. I know that. My father was a member of the NAACP in South Carolina, and he had to, was a brick mason. In order for us to live, in order for us to eat, money my mother was making as a teacher wouldn't provide too much of that in them days. You know what the salaries were. He had to travel and work out of town and come home on the weekend because the folk in my area wouldn't hire him. So I know what it was like for the leader that it was a rough fight. Amen. And I thank you for what you've done. Mm -hmm. To Ms. Anna Knowles, the WIN coordinator, who was my seatmate over there, sharing that lovely dinner. I want to commend her for the outstanding job of work she's done. And you can tell when people are doing work by how, how, how they respond. You notice when somebody called a name about a hard work, I heard them back there saying, amen, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you can't practice that. You can't rehearse that. It's either there or it ain't. So I know that she must be doing something good. Of course, by the same token, when you say something y'all don't like, y'all will be mumming under your breath. I know about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> to the other day's guests, to the beautiful models, and to the lovely young Tiara, Amen. beautiful young lady who I'm sure has a wonderful career in whatever she wants to do. But uh, I hope that she begins in modeling and use that skill as well. Amen. Delegates to this great convention. The most important group here. Y'all the one got the votes. <laughs> and I understand votes. You got to have the votes to do what you want to do. It's great to see all of you here. To our young delegates and to our young people in the audience. Amen. Many of them who I had the opportunity to shake their hands as I, I walked through the crowd. I, I'm happy to see you here. Stay with this organization. Amen. Make it what you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And to my other fellow NAACPers, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be in the state of Kentucky. We come together at this Freedom Fund dinner at a time that is 32 days before a general election. Now there's some good things gonna happen in this election. Mm -hmm. At this election, we're gonna elect over 38 to 40 blacks to the U.S. House of Representatives. <laughs> and it's likely that we're gonna elect our first black United States Senator since Edward Brooke. Mm -hmm. A lady, <laughs> Ms. Carol Mosley Brown. <laughs> At the same time, on November 3rd, we're gonna elect a president. Mm -hmm. I don't hear no whole lot of... <laughs> Clapping on that one. <laughs> and we've got two and a half candidates <laughs> in the race. <laughs> one side is preoccupied with the draft from the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Who cares about the war? Vietnam currently, except for the men and women who gave their lives. We care for them. But who cares about the process of the draft? The other side is unable to strain itself from talking about that famous read my lips boo-boo. 
about taxes. And the half side, <laughs> you <people. laughs> that's your people. <laughs> <laughs> is ready to spend over a hundred billion dollars to vindicate in his getting out of the race and to justify why he got back in. <laughs> but none of them are talking about the real issues. Amen. I'm talking about the, the survival issues that this nation needs to confront. That's why with the good side of all of these blacks that we're gonna elect to all of these offices, House, Senate, local legislative, county councils, school boards and cities, with all of that, with all of that, with this bad side, that's why tonight I come before you, my brothers and sisters and my friends, with mixed emotions, real mixed emotions. On the one hand, I'm saddened by the present state of America, especially of urban America. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I, I feel a sense of optimism because I recall an ancient Chinese proverb that says, chaos breeds opportunity. Chaos breeds opportunity, and it has chaotic events in Los Angeles have forced this country, despite what the politicians do or say, mm -hmm. forced it to focus its attention on the twin problems of urban decay and social injustice. Amen. They forced them to do that. And whether you or I view the, the 40 lives lost, the millions of dollars of property burned, the many jobs lost, as the products out there as a rebellion or a riot, you and I have to know in our heart of hearts that what Abraham Lincoln said over 130 years ago is still true today. And that is a house divided against itself cannot stand. <laughs> Likewise, this country cannot continue half affluent half impoverished, Amen. just as it couldn't continue half slave and half free. Amen. Some folk, some white folk and some colored folk, <laughs> have sought to depict the aftermath of the Rodney King verdict as a conflict between blacks, Koreans, and Hispanics. Television coverage has, has repeatedly portrayed the story as a, as a war between these major ethnic groups. And talk radio shows have continued to play the same tune. But this is a cop out. Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is that African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, and poor, poor white folk, all four of us, are all excluded from the Council of Powers. Amen. We all have a common foe. The infrastructure of our cities and our families does not respect ethnic background. The joblessness that, that permeates this nation pays no homage to race. Mm -hmm. The drugs that are destroying our children does not stop at the gate to suburbia. Now does the crime that is invading our communities stop any particular place. And that's why, my friends, that we must all work together. Because whether we believe it or don't believe it, all of our destinies and our children's destinies are inextricably entwined. And that's why we've got to lay aside our differences of culture, Amen. our differences of language, mm -hmm. our differences of race, and begin 
the process of coming together. I like to see both tables like that one, that one, and that one at our Freedom Fund dinners. Amen. Amen. We've got to come together. Because the conflicts along the great ethnic divide of our cities are not going to melt away overnight. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some time. Absolutely. The men and women of goodwill must begin, just like our founders in the back there began. We've got to begin the process of paving the way. Mm -hmm. In 1968, as he campaigned for the presidency, Robert Kennedy challenged every American to confront the anger and despair that had exploded in city after city across this country. He called for a renewed sense of purpose and commitment to a just society. And the question that he asked everywhere he went was, if not us, who? Mm -hmm. If not now, when? We all know the problems facing most minorities in this country. The scourges of drugs, unemployment, and underemployment, persistent personal and institutional racism, high rates of crime and violence, daily conditions sometimes akin to living in a war zone rather than in a country that is supposed to be the leader of the free world. Apparently, that New World Order that George Bush is always talking about doesn't include the cities in the United States. And that's why, my brothers and sisters, it's time for solutions, not just political sound bites and moralistic lectures. We've had enough of that. It's time not just for campaign sermons on, on family values <laughs> that don't address the survival problems that too many families face. Mm -hmm. Not just criticism of entertainers, whether it's Murphy Brown or Sister Soldier. Because <laughs> <laughs> then neither one of those ladies gonna solve the problem that we face. <laughs> and we've got to deal with that because neither the Democratic Party nor the Republican Party has paid more than lip service to the problems of our cities in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. I say that as a, one who hasn't been involved in the Democratic Party process. My resume, I've been to three conventions, actually been to four. But neither party in the last 20 years has paid more than lip service to the problems of our inner cities. And I haven't heard our other presidential option say too much about our cities to you people either. <laughs> He busy counting his money. <laughs> <laughs> Wish he'd take me in that yeah. counting room. <laughs> That's why, my friends, with the declining economic environment in this country, that's why with the, with the worsening racial crisis in this country, a crisis that has once again spawned the emergence of those three demented brothers. Y'all know the three brothers I'm talking about, don't you? Old Clue, yeah. Cluck, and Clan. <laughs> three bad brothers. Yeah. Heard they're doing a little recruiting around this way. Amen. And it's because of these kinds of things that we need vision, not politics as usual. Amen. We need a politics of inclusion to unite us, not a politics of division to distract us. We need an agenda. We need a plan. Mm -hmm. 
a plan to, to rebuild this country from the bottom up for all of its citizens, red, white, yellow, black, and brown, all of us. And we can do it if America has the will and the commitment to develop the plan. Amen. And why should she? Didn't they have a plan for Kuwait and Saudi Arabia? Absolutely. Didn't Congress approve a multi-billion dollar plan for the former Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. Didn't they have a half trillion dollar plan? I'm talking about trading with a T now. <laughs> not an M, not a B, but a T. <laughs> and they're gonna have to spend more than that half trillion for the savings and loan industry. Uh -huh. And didn't Bush just announce a billion dollar program to save the potato farmers? <laughs> now I ain't got nothing against potato farmers. <laughs> But there are a whole lot of problems in this country that are worse than what the potato farmers face. Amen. But if they've got, they've got all these plans, then why not a plan to, to feed the hungry? Mm -hmm. Why not a plan to, to house the homeless, clothe the naked, heal the sick? And why not a plan to provide a job for, for every American that wants to work? Those, my friends, are the questions that I want you to ask those seeking your vote November 3rd. You ain't got to wait. When they come around, ask them, are they gonna address these issues? Ask them to give you your solutions, not empty rhetoric. Ask them to, to respond to, to Rodney King's question. Can't we all get along? Ask them for deeds, not words. Ask them for action, not excuses. Ask them for leadership. Ask them to address the plight of the millions of Americans who are dispossessed in this country. Ask them to, to create goodwill right here at home in this country. Amen. As this country continues to try to to buy goodwill around the world. Ask them, cajole them, utilize your political clout that you got to force them. But remember well while you're doing all this, the words of Dr. W.B. Du Bois and his call for the organization of the Niagara Movement when he wrote, we cannot and should not wait for the leadership of politicians. Amen. We must, in time of peril, provide our own leadership, mm -hmm. forge our own multi-ethnic coalitions, mm -hmm. field test our own solutions. We must once again, he said, show this nation the way toward racial harmony, social justice, and urban revitalization. The boys knew this back in 1905. Mm -hmm. What he was saying that I say and I say today, in other words, my friends, we've got to do it for ourselves. Amen. We must make real the dream of economic and political empowerment for the truly disadvantaged. We've got to give them hope where hope and bone has died. Mm -hmm. We must raise them up from the mire of disaffection and disillusionment. And we must lift them out of the depths of degradation and dejection. We must embrace them and try to understand their pain and frustration and, and lead them down the path of responsibility, promise, and hope. I'm talking about our dispossessed brothers and sisters, my friends. We must give them the promise of a decent job, a livable home, and self-respect. The capacity to, to educate their children, to, to provide for them, 
to care for them and the hope for their children of a better life. The basics, the fundamentals that too many of our folk have too long been denied. We must do what the president, the Congress, and the courts have refused to do. Amen. We must. We must do it with our own plan of action, since the politicians haven't seen fit to develop a plan of their own. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about a plan to, to rebuild this nation and put our people back to work. A plan to unite the resources in our communities and put this nation back on track. A plan for the revitalization of our cities that have created a permanent underclass. And it won't be easy, because nothing good, never easy. <laughs> but it's got to be done. And if we are to move America forward, we must do it. And we must all become involved. I'm going to close with a plea made 28 years ago by an NAACP Spain Gun medalist. Though longer than Rodney King's simple question, can't we all get along, the meaning and the essence is fundamentally the same. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. accepted the 19 Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, Norway, he said, we are faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. And this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often, he wrote, leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with lost opportunity because the tide in the affairs of men does not remain at the flood, it ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations, are written the pathetic words, too late. There's an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance, our neglect. The moving thing of rights and having writ moves on. Mm -hmm. We still have a choice today, Martin said. Nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. <laughs> this may well be mankind's last chance to choose between chaos and community. I say to you tonight, my friends, this may well be America's last chance to choose as well. God bless you.